happy you could swim here. How are you, Miami? Good morning, Miami. Good morning, America, North, Central, and South. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, Europe. Good evening, Asia. Thank you, all those of you that come out and see us a couple times a week. Mommies, daddies, especially mommies, daddies. We're in the peak of spring. The pools here in Miami have gotten pretty warm. Okay, especially when the kids come home from school, little baby brother, baby sister, maybe stayed home, maybe came home early from the daycare. Please, who's watching the pool? Who's watching the fence? All right, hey, Bambini is here. Good morning. How are you today, Bambi? It's great to see you. And then oh, I'm gonna have to turn you guys around so I could see you better. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Turn around. Come over here. So who's here? Sophie Cordova. Sophie Cordova. Big hug to you. If you want to come in and talk a little bit about today's topic, it's gonna be in the area of controlling feelings and controlling thoughts. Which one are we in charge of? What are we doing to these children in the water? Trying to tell them it's okay, no pasa nada, and something is pasando, and they're at the top of their I don't want to go, and screaming for mom, and mom is going bonkers. And so we're talking about that today, and I know, Sophie, you're an expert, so I say hello to you. Chechita, hola, Chechi. Cuando quieras entrar, no es más que me mandan un saludito que dice, I want to join you, Coach Robert. Cafecito lunes en la mañana, delicioso. Miren las colitas aquí paradito, qué bueno. Uh -huh. Yep. I love this paliacate in case you never saw it. Light blue, beautiful. Hey, Bugs Bunny, ¿cómo están? Buenos días, gusto verlos. Mark. Anytime you want to come up, like I just started to explain to people, if you want to come in today and talk about how do we control the thoughts of the person in the water who's scared, and number two, their feelings. Right? One thing is the thought and, and what they're perceiving from you, what you're creating in their perception, and another thing is what they're feeling, okay, Remember, heart is the first brain. And so Mark Routercross, it's good to see you. I'm glad to see you here with us. Uh, very Sarah, Sarachnia. Wow, very Sarachnia. How are you today? And again, like I always say, you're all welcome to come in and chat and have a good time on the learn to swim kind of stuff. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, you know, how can we keep people in the sympathetic system, nervous system, or in the parasympathetic system? The sympathetic system is that one that, you know, brings you kind of up front what the senses get, you know, uh, where in fact even your immune system is suppressed when you are experiencing anger, frustration, hatred. You might even be with some amount of madness, okay? Violent, aggressive, and bottom line, fearful. How do all these things happen? And we are trying to, hey, Mark Router coming up and talking to us. Feelings and thoughts. So Mark Rodericards is coming. There he is, back at Cafecito. Mr. Mark, welcome. Happy New Year. I haven't seen you a whole lot in the last, uh, I don't know, a couple of months maybe. I see you around the Cafecito every once in a while. I visit your pages. That uh, coaching stuff you do is certainly amazing. Well, this is a great topic about feelings and thoughts. That's yeah. uh, important. So well, let's, let, let's, let me kick that off with um, the feeling with the skin. You know, our, the skin is an organ that is so big. And that feeling when you get into wet or the feeling of cold or the feeling of your breeze, you know, the, your temperature is your feeling. 
So I think um, all of that matters in the, the tactile sense of feeling, right? Well, this is really interesting you mentioned that. I'm gonna tell you that touch, skin, the largest organ of the body, okay, like you very well said, is the only sense that does not lie. Oof, a really important person in my life and in the learn to swim industry just arrived in Cafecito with Coach Robert, all the way from Norway, Mr. Teria Stack said, how are you, Teria? Welcome to Cafecito. I wanted to meet Mark Routerkaus, who is keeping us company today. And we're talking in the differences of, you know, one is the thoughts, what's going in here, and maybe create some feelings in here. But Mark took a leap, a quantum leap, and went right away into the truth. What is our skin feeling? How are you carrying, holding, or touching the person that doesn't know how to swim? Do they perceive you as friendly, or are they going into the fight, flight, or hide mode from what they perceive? And so I, want to, I started to explain a little bit that while people are functioning in the nervous system, the sympathetic side of it, well, that's the antipatico side. That's not the simpatico side. What do I mean? The sympathetic nervous system is what we see, we hear, we feel, we smell, and of course, taste and touch. Babies taste a lot and touch a lot with mouth. And that's something we need to have ever present when we're teaching the babies in the water. Yes. Our goal, so to speak, as a good swim teacher is to move the children or the adult that's scared into the parasympathetic nervous system, where their perception of the environment is one of being friendly. You know, we want to move these kids away. It's not about suppressing their behavior when they scream and I'm scared. They probably have some kind of baggage, some kind of bad experience when they arrive in the pool or in the whatever environment that they don't perceive as friendly. But we need to keep them away from the anger, the frustration, the hated, the hatred. Um, their madness, you know, their violence, the aggressiveness, the fear, all these adverbs that describe negative sensations. Whereas if we bring them into the heartfelt emotions, we go right to the heart feelings and enter the parasympathetic nervous system, then we're gonna get emotions of gratitude, appreciation, kindness, care, love, maybe not necessarily love for the person working with you because you know that takes a little bit to create that kind of bond, but the love of life, the happiness of being where you're at, right? So these are, these are areas that when you bring the child to the water and you start with the blowing bubbles and the kick, 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 with due respect, to all the swim teachers or mommies, daddies that start there. That is not the starting point. When you start with that blow to bubbles and a kick, 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 I know all you have in your mind is swimming. And swimming is not necessarily to the baby, to the two, three, four year old, what was ontogenetically installed in us. And so, you know, every time I mention the ontogenetics and the phylogenetics, because it's something we really need to understand. Ontogenetic is everything was installed in the factory and we can swim. However, when phylogenetically we start disturbing those genes that know how to move hands, legs or whatever, what happens? We start with a kick, kick, kick and we distract from what we could have done to swim by nature. Now, needless to say, the person doesn't know how to swim, is not tuned into the viscosity of water, well, needs a little more time of play, of discovery, 
of realizing that when you're in the water, you fall up, is only when you're on the water, you fall down. Yeah? So, um, in terms of starting the classes, beginning the classes, you know, and, and we do a lot of five and under, and I know you do a lot of, you know, real swimmers in the water, you know, the fast guys. Well, let me tell you, those guys need to perceive your environment in the racing tank the same way. When your kids come into practice and they're waiting for you to arrive, that's the funnest day. When you get to the pool and the kids start coming in late and later and everyone an excuse of why late and why they this, class practices ain't the same. Then when everybody is, you arrive and they're maybe jumping off the racing block, maybe doing racing times, maybe. But wow, they're at the pool ready to go. It makes a big difference. What do you feel in that department? Yeah, I like the um, falling up idea. The um, yeah, trust, and you mentioned the one other word, respect. You know that you know that that's like a love of um, of being present. Yeah. So so how do you then get those we ones started? You don't like blowing bubbles. I know that. And and. <laughs> and, and 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 you don't like uh, the kicking right away, but so you're gonna. What are you gonna do instead? Well, I take swimming out of my mind. You know, I'm gonna be in a conference in May with this lady that teaches in Spain. She's one of the real geniuses I've run across in all these cafecito shows. Her name is Leno Army. She publishes a little bit in English, mostly in Spanish, but you could get the translations on the Instagram. Do look her up. Okay. Leno Army is the name of her company, and her name is uh, Suriol. Noemi, N-O-E-M-I, Suriol, S-U-R-I-O-L, a genius. And she says something like, kids in my swim school learn to swim, and we're not even talking about swimming. I love that because why? Okay, so what do I do with these children that come for time one or two and want to kind of, you know, learn to swim? Well, how about understanding that we have very, very shallow water, a ramp entry, a beach entry. But when we don't, we use tables in the water that give the little guys enough height to have the water up to here, maybe a rail for security so they don't topple over too easily in the initial stages, and we walk. And before you know it, this is natural instinct of little guys. Once they start to walk, they want to run also, <laughs> especially because the head is a little top heavy, you know. So if we're on the ramp, it's amazing how, whoa, the deeper water just sucks them right in. And we're in the uh-oh, be careful, homie, homie, homie. So we're not even talking about swimming. We're talking safety all the time. And we want to take the little mistakes they make, all right? The toppling over and they fall down. It's difficult. Mark, this is really difficult with mom by your side. And, and by the way, I do want mom here, here, not there, there. As much as mommy says, oh, when I'm with him, he's spoiled, I don't want, you know something? At those stages before age four, it doesn't matter. It's more important to have mommy here. And when a kid starts to yell and scream, you know, you know how in sales you sell when you get yeses from the buyer? <laughs> no, it's also, yeah, right, right. Right? Yeah, you want to sell a car, then you're asking the guy, hey, do you want white tires or do you want radio or do you want uh, AM, FM or do you want uh, CD? And, and then you say yes to everything they're giving you. And bottom line is, <laughs> well, now you sign on the dotted line and you sold. Well, when you have the baby, what is the classic question to get a yes? To start selling that he can be with you. What is the key question? Pay with me, yelling, screaming, mommy right here, you know, two feet away. And what do you ask? 
Well, I do know that you're another word for that getting those yeses are micro commitments. So right, but but you got me on what to ask. I'm I'm gonna get, leave it to you. Do you want to go with mommy? Oh. Uh huh. Okay, mommy, baby Mikey wants to go with you. Mommy, baby Susie wants to go. Marky, do you want to go with mommy? Uh huh. And they even tell you, man, that's what they want to do. Okay, mommy, Marky coming to you. Ready. And we take that little short two foot, three foot swim right to mommy. And we say, I knew you could do that. That was beautiful. And baby all of a sudden is like, hey, I didn't drink anything. And, and of course, the classic line is, you flied. I give it a, a connotation to the past tense of flying and I call it, you flied. And the baby is like thinking about it. But yes, he didn't fall down. Why? Because the hair was in the water up to here. And so I continue saying, sink them a little bit to get them to mom. Don't allow the head to come up to there because they start to fall down again. And so mommy kind of, come, you go with Mr. Robert and the baby wrapped around mommy. Well, if the baby is wrapped around mommy, you don't want to create any more anger or frustration, right? Never, and you never say never, but I'm going to say never peel a baby from their mom like you're taking the skin out of the banana. <laughs> because if anybody needs to do any kind of imposed behavior here, it's the mom. The mom needs to figure out to get those little arms off, those little legs off, and hand the baby over back to the teacher happily. Okay. Now, there is, there is certain um, statements, or, or, or statements is the right thing, I, I think here, that we need to teach mom not to use while they're with baby. What do you mean? Well, mommy sees the baby in distress, and we have to understand this. Whenever your child is crying, you're hurting. When your child is screaming, you feel the inner side of yours. He's twilling on your weakest area and your amygdala starts going into the same alarm the baby is in and the thalamus and the hypothalamus are going, somebody act. And what does mommy say? It's okay, no pasa nada. Well, I'm gonna say it's not okay. Because if it was okay, mommy or the teacher wouldn't have to say. So where are we failing these kids when they're saying, we're saying it's okay and they don't perceive it? The environment is not friendly. Either they had a bad time at the school before, or you tried too soon. You went from the uh, ludicism too quickly to swimming. You forgot you're not gonna think about swimming. And yes, we're all under the stress or pressure of mommy saying, hey coach, but when is my kid gonna do like this? Hey coach, when is my kid gonna swim? It doesn't matter because no matter what you do, it's gonna take 50 to 100 hours of good quality water time. Right. So don't make him more upset and scream at the kid, it's okay, no pasa nada. Just don't say anything and bring the balls out and bring the duckies out and maybe slide a boat and maybe have a hydroplane and maybe just maybe whatever it is. The squim disc. You know, the squim disc. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, the squim disc is a very interesting toy because besides shooting to the goal when you're playing with a big mushroom kind of disc and the mushroom on top, uh, the squim disc is very soft. It has a really nice texture and babies love it until they start biting in it. <laughs> yeah. and they all want to sink their teeth into that foamy kind of, you know, uh, goody here. Look, there are people here from Brazil, from Mexico. Hello, Nivea. Nivea is coming to Miami to visit. Verena, all the way from Spain, is here visiting you. Hello, Verena. And then 
Air Ted, I, don't, I, I never met Air Ted before. Christy Guadarrama from Mexico, Serrato, Marsa. Marsa Serrato, I don't know where you're from, but you're very welcome. So, just like every time, you know, we get the folks that habla la espanol and they tune me out because maybe they don't habla that much el inglés. And then the other way around, I start on the Espanol show, and then those folks that habla la inglés, then, ah, he's on the Spanish mode. I don't understand this. So anyway, nothing like speaking a bunch of languages. Um, Mark, it's so important if the child comes in that height, flight, or fight mode, that we turn them around into the thankful and gratitude, kind of the emotions that really make the heart jump a joy. This is where the key goes to making the classes, the fun classes. And then parents say to you, but you play him a little bit too much with my kid. Why, do, why, why is my teacher playing all the time with my kid? I want him to learn to swim. So this is a delicate area because there's play that is conducive, is the preamble to that swimming. So the play, in our case, includes chasing little things, toppling over. And again, when the kids have these accidental accidents, can you say that word, accidental accidents? <laughs> Or maybe we call them accidental incidents since there's no blood involved, no boo-boo, no eyes. You make those aha moments. If the child falls, right, they're screaming to you, I don't want to go under, whatever it is. Don't force them below the surface of the water. It's not scary to go below the surface of the water. And that's the first thing I tell mommies and daddies and teachers to understand. However, it is really scary not to be able to go back up to take your next bite because you're asphyxiating and asphyxia is a life-threatening situation. So how do we fix that? Well, I'm going to tell you, my favorite, you never let go. You never grab, you give an open hand and you allow the learner to grab. And the decision to let go belongs to? The kid. To the learner. Because it could yeah. be an adult. Yeah, right. All right? And so the decision to let go, why? Because they feel certain trust, certain confidence that they can hold on to that hand and take the next breath at will. That brings me into the chapter that I have to every day kind of do a little bit of this. And I don't know if you've seen this little Yeah. Thing. They're great, yeah. All right. Uh, they're great. You know, it's it's a reinvented invention because how long ago did you use those little inflatable little, you know, bubble things? Yeah. The tube of a football and uh, covered with with a cloth material and you a little air tied with a belt on a tummy. All right. Or for many years we've had those other belts that have two little blocks, the, the little floaty foams. But this was the stroke of a genius because it does kind of the same. It helps you when you're vertical, okay? Here's the chest and here's the tummy. And it helps you when you're vertical to stay up and breathe easy. The only secret, in my opinion, to discover swimming is that you can take the next breath easily and every next breath should be as good as? The first one. The first one. What do you mean the first breath? That happened lots of breaths ago. Yeah, but sometimes the last breath came in with a little water, or sometimes you, you came, the last breath was not as good as that first breath. And so the person starts on the <laughs> and, and that's desperado mode. That's going back into fear. That's going back into frustration that I can't do it. Well, it's not about going long distances initially. It's about flying. And when you convince these folks not to kick, 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 and not to slap their hands to the water as strong as they could, but to just rest and ride, 
you get back to my video years ago called why swim if you could fly <laughs> as we see these great athletes today they are flying how fast we saw swimming going on in japan a few months ago and you know what we're gonna see faster swimming at the world championships already humans don't seem to have limits right they're fast which they're flying, they're flying. <laughs> hey when i swam 55 seconds to qualify 50 years ago to have the right to swim make the the whatever the b cut was in those days to get into fina uh races wow it was a national record in mexico today 55 doesn't even win a girls race <laughs> So times are, are, are not changing because we continue on this upward progress curve. So what is changing? Are men bigger and women bigger? Are we training different? Are we eating better? What's going on? Well, for one thing, uh, we didn't see too many six foot four, six foot six kind of swimmers when I swam. Right. You know, so the size, we know the longer vessel is a faster boat. And so back to the learn to swim. I, I talk about the shark fin. Well, they call it the swim fin, like you could see here uh, backwards. I'll, I'll show it to you straightwards. Let me give you a twist around now that we said hello to everybody came to visit. Did I skip anybody? Well, the swim oh, fin in America joined. Whoa, look at here. Iris is here. Linda Paola from Colombia, uh, swim coach. Swim, swim coach C. Hello, coach C. Good morning. Patty Kays, the Kaiser is here. Vicky, Vicky from Colombia. Sometimes the parents wants to get results without fun, but our best tool is their smile. That's very true, Christy. The parent wants to get results, and the truth is we get the results by making sure the child wants to come back again and again until they've had their 50 to 100 hours of good quality water time. Now, I make this very clear to the parents. They don't need 100 lessons one-on-one. -on -one. They need the parent to learn. That's why I want the parents here, here, because they're 20, 27 with a kid. And I'm only with him 20 minutes, once, maybe twice a week. So this is where the children have to spend the time playing at home the key is the bath not everybody needs to have a pool oh look at the big bone that luke just brought me <laughs> come on luke. over there all right so christy had a, a good comment there and it's all about the perception of the kids ludicism versus hygienic bath at home I know oftentimes the mom needs to put the kid in the water, you know, soap up the important parts, roll them up in a taco, put the bottle in there, and to bed they go. Okay, everybody's in a rush. <laughs> but the ludic bath, the bath where you sit with the child in the tub, you spill water over your face, and the kid soon takes his cup and spills water over himself. The time you play peekaboo, Whatever it is that you're spending 20, 30 minutes in water, that's what it takes to pile up your 50 hours of good quality water time. Mom doesn't need to spend uh, the ransom of a king <laughs> to go to swimming lessons. Mom needs to play with the baby. And don't be forcing them and dunking what have you. Going below the water is not the problem. The problem is when you yank your hand away and the kid goes <sighs> because we scare up the nose. There, you never want to go back below the surface. Give me three seconds. I turn you around and now we can show everybody the fin right here, swim fin. All right. Well, let me say this, guys, about the swim fin. 
If you're interested in playing with something like this, number one, the kids, you get to the pool and they go, baby shark. And that is so popular these days, it's not even funny how many miles you get out of the kid that is on the doo 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 doo, right? Then these guys come in like orange and black or gray and green and blue and pink. A choice for everybody. And number two, it'll help them. It'll help them to stay vertical. You don't need to force the horizontality of swimming. Horizontalization to swim needs to be discovered also, in my educated opinion. What do I mean? What do you mean discover? But that's the only way to swim. Again, you're thinking swimming, not ludicism, not learning to discover one. So what do I see everybody here? Let me bring a, uh, you met COVID in the past. Everybody <laughs> wants to hold the baby like this. Only most babies don't hold their head in line with their spine when they're horizontal. Most babies do this and they yank, you know, this guy's got a tight neck here and they yank their neck up. Why? Because they need to be breathing. <laughs> And maybe they didn't want to go in the water. This position of the head immediately loads the hips, which makes you go vertical. If you've kept the baby vertical, and just at the time you say, ready, you roll them side, you dip them in, you take, and they don't unhinge the head. And they learn that with the head down, they could fly so quickly. And again, don't shove at speeds they don't reach. And don't let go. Don't disconnect. Let the child be the one to decide to push you away if they don't want your hand. Let the child put their feet on your tummy and push off if that's what they want to do. And if they push off to wall, to table, to steps, to the safety area. Safety areas means wherever you can hold on with your little hands and pick up your head by yourself, right? If they push off to the middle of the pool, you also let them. And you let them take it in the chin for doing something silly like that. You're gonna say, well, he's a baby. He doesn't know how to do. Listen, no matter what age they are, they're not stupid and they're not suicidal. They just, ignorant of consequences. Why? Because they never did it. But you let that kid push off your tummy once in the middle of the pool and you don't get them, you relax, you wait till they turn, you pick them up and you say, baby, you scared me. You're little to do these things. They right away have a good time. They have a good time scaring you. <laughs> it's, it's such a different way to understand that swimming needs to be discovered because in the factory, they installed the genes that know how to swim. <clears throat> Mark, have you taught adults how to swim? Sure, yeah. Where do you start? Well, um, it, it depends. Yeah, trust, you know, that, it, you know, it, some, um, you know, adults definitely can, can reason a little more. Close your lips is a good place to start, you know, so that, that, that when they do um, suck for air, they're certainly in the air, you know. So I, I like to say, um, you know, and also try, you know, that's another word. Let's, we can try things. So try again. So it's a repetitive <laughs> thing. Yes. Yeah. I think most adults hate the water because they were on their back at some point, somebody holding them, and as it felt like they floated and they're touching the water gently, the helper lets go of the head, the head sinks about two centimeters and the water goes over the face and half of the pool up the nose and then the brains get wet. <laughs> I don't wanna go swimming. Don't teach me how to float no more. Let me get out of here, you know? Well. Uh, I heard you say something that is a no-no forever in swimming. I heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, close your lips. 
Never. 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 Open your mouth. How do we breathe when you learn to swim? You're doing a 50 freestyle. You're doing a 1500 freestyle. You're doing a 10K freestyle. How did you take a breath, every breath, until the 1500 or 10K? We, the mouth. Yes, yeah, right. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is open your mouth. A little water in the mouth, you spit it out. A little goes the wrong way, you learn not to. But if you shut the mouth and the person is about to enter the water, they're and they try to take a breath and the timing is not perfect. Now you set them up to smell the breath, to sniff the water. Whatever. Right. And that's a big scare. So I'm gonna get away from shut your mouth and I'm gonna get into the open your mouth because of breathing needs. Now, in that same 50, 100 or 10K that you just swam on freestyle, how did you exhale the whole way? Often through your mouth or a little bit through your nose too. Yeah, through your nose, yeah, especially on the turns. You the gotta nose. have to make your mind. I will tell you that 90% of the air should escape the nose. Okay, yeah. Why so? The nose is like a bottle. If I take a bottle in the water, beat down, I take the, even a cup like this, put it in the water, how much water goes in it? None. None, water does not climb. And the air inside the cup is impeding that water. No matter how deep you go, water ain't going up. Now, as soon as I take that bottle and I start turning it, bloop, 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 air escapes and a little water comes in the bottle. Or of course, if it's a cup with a mouth yay big, it'd probably fill up as you turn it over and the air escaped, the water filled in. The nose is like a bottle. When I take the nose straight down in the water and pick it up, another reason why babies will go like this, because they go down and go up, okay, no water goes up the nose. But if I turn the baby, that's where I shudder a little bit on that forced backflow, because as I roll them, I know they're not blowing, at least where the air coming out of them, the pressure of the air coming out of you through the nose needs to be equal or a pinch larger than the pressure of the water trying to get in on the rollout. Right. Number two, your nose has valves, imaginary valves, right here. Just like the spigot in the sink at the kitchen in the bathroom. What do you mean? Well, I can open the valves a whole lot and boom, a lot of water come out. I can open the valves on my nose all the way and one breath you can't even time how quickly i <sighs> and all my air went out i could shut the valves on the sink and shut my imaginary valve here no air escapes and i can play with the valves on the sink so i can have a little drop 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 or a string of water coming out like i can adjust the valve here and now I could breathe maybe every seven or every nine, but I should be doing it with a mm. Now I'm turning the voice on so you get the idea that I'm letting air escape out my nose and I could go into the tibet and for 45 seconds, mm. the same breath that you couldn't time a second ago now takes a long time to exhale. So this valve of the nose, this manipulation of the nose takes a while. It's not like magic. And of course, if you've said to the kid, shut your mouth, here comes the water, you know, up the nose. It takes a little bit. When can children start singing with the nose? About age two, three. And so with due respect, I don't know who invented to blow lip bubbles, but there is a microchip up here that when the residual volume down here is X, it sends a message to the diaphragm, little muscle that is opening and closing the, the lungs. Hey, there's not enough air in there. Breathe it in. I need more air. I need oxygen. The heart starts screaming. The lungs are yelling. Send me stuff. The muscles are working. So, but when you're below the surface, the glottis and the epiglottis are so bright, they don't let no air come in, and especially not down to the lungs. Maybe you swallow a bunch of water, maybe it goes to your tummy, but it ain't going in the lungs. And so 
you know, these things that, that, that seem to me now, because I've worked and studied so much of this topic, normal, when I speak to normal people, they look at me like, this guy's weird. What do you mean, don't blow bubbles? Who invented and how did they prove that blowing bubbles is a way to learn to swim? And the other B5 God, if everybody understands that there's truckload of neurons in here in the CPU, and to activate these extremities or the distal extremities, an axon, a long, long nerve needs to shoot out of there. And in the terminal stages, a bunch of dendrites appear, little tiny roots that send synapses to make this movement, to make this movement, to make any movement. It comes from that long axon. And people start with the legs, the distal extremities. You know how much longer it takes that axon to grow from neuron to leg compared to neuron to hand? So why do we start with a kick, kick, kick? Because we, the teachers, the mom, the dad, are afraid to put the kid below the surface because, whoa, what if he gets scared? And yet it's so easy to go below the surface, no problem, do your little balloon face. I asked you a second ago, how did you start with the adult? Well, I'm gonna start with the adult with a balloon face. Can you make a balloon face? You forgot to take the breath before the balloon face. Oh, and now you make the lips tight. And don't go below the surface. Be looking at the pace clock on the side of your pool and your non-swimmer adult holds their breath miraculously 20 seconds, maybe 30. And if you got a good triathlete with you, he can hold the breath a minute. And now you look at him point black and you say, we're gonna do the same thing below the surface. But I don't want you to do it 20 seconds. I just want you to do it four seconds. And they look at you like, come on, I did it 20, I can do it. No, 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 let's just do it till four. And you get them to immerse holding the wall, brother, or holding your hand in the wall, whatever they need to trust that they, oh, and with your free hand, you count to number four and you get them up. And you look at them smiling and you say, how did it go? Easy. And for the first time in their life, they were below the surface for four seconds, no crisis. Next, all right, we're gonna hide in the water. Can you do it till five? Can you do it till six? Could you stay there till 10? Now, when you get them to 10, which is piece of cake for the swimmer, but for the non-swimmer, if you start a cake, at the 10 is a, is my, is a mountain. <laughs> right. Ain't no mountain high enough. Well, let me tell you, you can make the mountain very high if you don't take these little steps of success. Just like with the little guys, the little ant steps of success. And you start getting these folks to be comfortable below the surface. Now you say, we're gonna lie down on the water. You get them horizontal, hold the wall, hold your breath until 10, you already did it. I'll count the numbers for you. You know what, let's just do it until six bring it back to an easier number, so to speak. Maybe you count slower and now you go one, two, three, and you make the six laugh at 10, but you made it lesser, right? And so they start falling up and they're happy with the water looking to the bottom and they stay and they fly. Wow, I didn't fall down. I says, because the trick is, you know, that, that little balloon face. Now they get a little addicted to the balloon face. Now you want them to get to breathe. Well, don't do that unless someone keep the balloon face going. Go to the ladder that you can hold on to the ladder in the deep end at seven foot, whatever it is, or stay on the shallow and go get the brush you clean the pool with, you push the vacuum with. Step out of the pool for a second with your beginner, hold the pole firm, and tell them to go hand over hand down the pole with that little balloon face. <gasps> Oop! And then they grab that pole on the way back up, even though they're falling over. You look at them, if you grab my pole any harder, you're gonna bend it. And so now they go hard to go down and they start letting go and they see that they fall up. Mm. It's a discovery. It's a discovery of starting swimming from the bottom up.
don't teach swimming in the surface. Swimming on the surface, the surface is where we race. It's the hardest place to swim. And in styles, forget, that. that's totally phylogenetic. That's a human discovery way past the womb. The butterfly, the backs are compressed, are going, sure, they're all good. And you race in those styles, but it's not necessarily the definition of swimming. And when you leave us today, the homework is gonna be, go find out what Webster's define swimming as. You will not believe. If you can move in water and take breaths at a comfortable interval, you're swimming. Doesn't talk about fly back breaths of free, which brings us to that safety area that people don't need to start with freestyle. Maybe they don't even need to start with breaststroke. I think the Europeans, the Russians, the Japanese especially, have the right idea starting with the froggy style. No extremity comes out of the water for a little added weight. But the Australians and the Americans are the best swimmers in the world. We decided we're going to start teaching swim with a kick, kick, kick. So we start with freestyle. So, okay, we'll do it. It's, I guess, one of those things that order of the factors doesn't alter the product. <laughs> um, try next time you teach an adult and give me some feedback. You come back to Cafecito, we talk about it. Okay. You know, just start teaching from with your little pole, take him to seven foot, let him let go and fly to the top. Let him swim hand on the wall and hand on the water like we do with the three-year-olds. One hand for traction in and so the wall at hand so that anytime you want to breath, you just grab it. You... <sighs> maybe they blow, maybe they don't. It's not important. First, learn to fly, learn to fall up. And I think in line with that, learn to go to the bottom without the help of the pole or the step ladder. Learn to dig and dig and dig until you get there. Learn to maybe do a handstand in four or five foot deep water where you could stand up at any moment, but you start kind of, you know, hypothalamus, thalamus, cerebellum, hearing, all those areas of balance start all working together. And in the water, everything is moving at the same time. And it works. It works. And that's part of play. The adult that wants to learn to swim also doesn't need to start with a kick, kick, kick. The adult that is learning to play, uh, I take it back, the adult that is learning to swim also needs to be in some form of ludicism so that they can let all that stress from so many years, all that anger. So we get him into the parasympathetic system and that's the system of relaxation. The parasympathetic nervous system is the regeneration of our metabolism. That's where we can, and, you know, between joke and joke, we started pretty much on time. You asked me to come into the show today. I'm doing a little bit more. You know, people are asking me to teach them more, that I'm letting people come and tell us what they do. Robert, but you've taught a lot and you go to all these conferences. But I still love to have, you know, I can't thank you enough, Mark. Oh, sure. Hey, well, one, I have one little question. Do you put the, the swim fin on the adults? Do, you do I use the... swim fins on adults? Absolutely. Okay. Ask I... question. If, once we're done with all this play stuff, I even put them on their back with a lane line right on their tummy, lane line over here, toes, 10 toes, one on each side of where the lane line hooks up on the wall. All right, so five toes on each side of the lane line, rope on this side of me, I'm holding near my neck, and now I'm gonna push the lane line up or push myself up below the surface and mm, a lot of nose blowing because I mm, just learning to produce a force of air, a pressure of air coming out of me equal or a bit larger than the pressure of the water. When the nose is totally exposed, needless to say, is the scariest spot, okay? But now you, they wanna move. They came to learn to swim, put the fins on. Yeah, definitely. Because most adults' ankles are not floppy. Right. 
My ankles are floppy from 68 years of swimming, if you want to call it that. And yet I'm a very slow kicker today because I don't have that ricochet that I might have had at one time. And so I can't kick 40 seconds in a 53 if you pay me, but I'm going to kick it in a minute 20. <laughs> Why? With fins, real well. With fins, I'll fly. I'll go 15 right. seconds in a 25 down and back, maybe a 32. I'm good with my turn on the turn with the board. I'll flip probably get the fins around quicker on a flip and then grab the board on the one hand and roll back up on it. But yes, fins are necessary. Why? Because your largest organ of your body, your skin, again feels that passage of water showering you as you go in through the water. And that feeling is really important in the development of swimming in the human being. Definitely. Everybody loves to be towed by the boat, whether it's on a floaty or just skin wise, grab your berth and let them pull you at 15, 20. It feels awesome. Then you let go because you want to take a breath. You know? But anyway, um, I got to do a little more teaching, but I love when people like you, because when you come and you give me hard questions, <laughs> it's a pleasure. You give, me, you give me memory, memory boost. The hard questions make us i like that memory boost <laughs> marcus let's okay. play a little song of all the repertoire and our little swim gym oh how about ring around the dolphins a pocket full of fishes i love that we just did it the other day <laughs> Doo -doo 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 -doo.